Last week, I made a video all about the James Webb Space Telescope as we get ever closer to the planned launch date of the 31st of October, 2021. And in that video, we chatted about, you know, what the plan was, what science it was going to be able to do, and what fields it would revolutionize. But I also chatted to my friend and colleague, Dr. Sarah Kendrew, who works at the European Space Agency at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore in the USA. Now, she's been working with the James Webb Space Telescope team on the MIRI instrument for 10 10 years now. So I wanted to try and get the inside scoop for you all on what was going on inside the team. Now in the video the other day, I probably only left in about five minutes or so of our actual chat. So as promised, here is the full length version. So Sarah, JWST is such a huge intercontinental collaboration. There must be so many people involved, each with their own little niche thing that they do. So what is your role in the collaboration? What are you responsible for? So I work for the European Space Agency and I'm based at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. We have a team of European uh, scientists and engineers there who kind of you know, represent the European involvement uh, in the mission. Uh, specifically, I work on one of the four uh, science instruments on board JWST. Uh, I work on an instrument called MIRI, which is stands for the Mid-Infrared Instrument um, on the telescope. Uh, and I've been involved in, the, in this instrument for over 10 years now, since about 2008. Uh, I'm responsible specifically for one of the spectroscopy modes, the low resolution spectroscopy mode on MIRI. And so um, my job from day to day is incredibly varied. So some of it is, you know, software and uh, figuring out how we best operate and calibrate the data that we get back from the instrument, but also providing user support. So writing documentation, um, providing answers to uh, people who want to use uh, MIRI uh, and help them understand what the capabilities are and how they can best like, put together their observations, basically. Nice. And I guess since you've worked so closely with Miri and, and developing it and getting all of those help things online, by the time it's actually up and running, I guess you're hoping to use it as well for your own science. Like, what are you hoping that you'll be able to do with Miri that maybe, or with JWST in general, that you haven't been able to do before, like questions that you haven't been able to answer before without Miri? Yeah, it's been really interesting, actually. So in the past sort of six months or so, uh, we've been through this process of soliciting proposals from the whole community um, for using JBUST. And as somebody who's been involved with, you know, developing the instrument, um, it's been incredibly fascinating to now see what people are planning to do with the observatory after launch. Um, things I'm particularly excited about, um, quite a, a range of things, really. Um, but, but one really exciting area is going to be looking at exoplanet atmospheres. So this is, you know, we can study the atmospheres of exoplanets as they kind of move in front of and behind their host star. And um, the infrared is a really good uh, wavelength region to kind of study exactly kind of like the molecules that might be in the atmospheres and the dynamics of the atmospheres and whether they have clouds and things like that. So that's going to be a really exciting area of research that I've been, um, you know, collaborating uh, in. And I'm really looking forward to those data. Um, another area, which is completely the other end of the spectrum uh, for a science program that um, I, I will be working on, is looking at um, very uh, dusty galaxies in the high redshift universe. Um, and because these galaxies have so much dust in them, they're forming tons and tons of stars. But because of all the dust in there, we've not really been able to get much information about the stars because the starlight is kind of hidden behind these curtains of dust. And so we've really needed uh, an observatory like JWST um, to really kind of uh, probe deep into those kind of dusty regions and see uh, the stars, you know, get the light from the stars that's behind them. So that's something very new uh, that we'll be able to do with Webb. Uh, and I'll be involved in a program that's going to be doing exactly that. And is the expectation that those stars will be different to, say, the stars in our own Milky Way? Or like, what's the, the question that you sort of want to find out about these stars once you can finally see through the dust? A lot of these galaxies are kind of in the early universe. So we are looking back in time. So there'll be fewer old stars uh, than we have uh, currently in the Milky Way. Uh, so that we expect there'll be lots of sort of young hot stars uh, forming. 
We also know the, the rates at which these galaxies are forming stars are incredibly high, so really much higher than what we see kind of in the present day universe around us. Um, but we've really not been able to kind of tally up what's forming uh, and what types of stars and things like that. And so for that, we've really needed something like Webb um, to kind of get a good census, to be able to like add up everything that's there and to kind of map them out morphologically as well and see, you know, where the stars are forming. Uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope, we've had uh, data that have looked at shorter wavelengths, but there the light really can't get through all the dust. So we've, we've only been able to get very limited information from those galaxies. I love that. A, a star census. I hadn't thought about it that way before, but it's a really good way of putting it. So I was wondering as well. So I've been thinking about, you know, the launch date we talk about all the time, October 2021, and, and, and it's been pushed back a few times. Can you give us any insider info on like, obviously it'll be launched, take a couple of weeks to get there or then unfold everything and unfurl. And then there's presumably so many like checks and calibrations that the team has to go through to check everything's working all right. Do we know, like, uh, do people have a date in mind for like first light, you know, that first sort of glimpse through the telescope or like, or even when we expect maybe the first scientific paper using data from from web will will finally come down. I think that's the day I'm excited for the most is like the first paper I open on the archive that's like, we used the James Webb Space Telescope to do this, right? Do we have any idea of when that could be? So to get papers, we need people to write them. Uh, but certainly <laughs> the observations, you know, we, we kind of uh, know a bit more about that. So So like you said, the first few weeks and months after launch are going to be incredibly hectic. So the, uh, you know, first the observatory will have to deploy and we'll have to travel out to L2. And then gradually we'll start kind of testing all the different functions and operations uh, of all the different systems at the observatory and the science instruments as well. Um, and there's, you know, there's a timeline for that and a process. And that's something that we're actually practicing uh, a lot right now. This is a huge part of the preparations we're currently going through. Um, as soon as a, uh, a mode or an instrument is kind of what we call ready for science. So we've kind of checked everything and we've verified that everything's working as, as planned. Um, then we will do some kind of initial observations uh, with, with that particular instrument or that particular mode. And so um, that's called the early, early release observations. Um, and so those will all be released at the end of commissioning. Mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, about six months uh, after launch. So basically we'll be doing some very early science observations um, throughout the commissioning period. And so that we will get some amazing images and data and spectra together um, that we can release to the public to kind of really showcase how things are working. Nice. So I guess March, April. So this time next year. Yeah. This is when we should sort of be thinking, maybe we'll see some first images. Do we know, I did actually ask my Instagram followers like what they wanted to ask and stuff. And so, so many people, so Jason Clark and Mick Yellen as well, they all asked, do we actually know what that first target will be? Like the first thing, does it depend on like what instrument is ready first? Like what it will look at first? Like, has it been decided like the Eagle Nebula or something like that is, is gonna be the one? Or is it just going to be like on the fly? Like, what should we look at, everybody? <laughs> like... <laughs> so it's definitely not going to be on the fly. So this is something that people are working on, that the targets will be decided beforehand. And we do know already kind of what instruments will be ready first. Mm -hmm. So there's actually a lot of work going into this. Um, but uh, all we know, and even for myself as, you know, being part of the project, I don't know what those targets will be. Uh, so this is being kept very tightly under wraps. It'll be a bit of a surprise, but I mean, we know that they're going to be some like really spectacular targets. So, cause we really want this to kind of showcase how amazing the observatory is. Um, so, so they will be, they will be beautiful, but even I don't know what they actually um, are. There'll also be, you know, JWST is a very uh, spectroscopic uh, observatory. So there's, you know, we will have some stunning images, but we will also have some um, amazing spectra. Um, and so, so a lot of the first release data as well will also be spectra. And so we're putting a lot of effort into making sure that people can like really understand like mm -hmm. the amazingness of, of yeah. those data as well. 
That'd be really cool. Can you imagine just like they come back down and it's just all those scientists drooling over like a line. <laughs> it's the spectra. <laughs> and everyone else be like, but where's the pretty picture? And we're like, but look at it. Look how deep clear this line is in the spectra. Yeah. I was wondering as well. So there's been so many in instances of space telescopes that have exceeded expectations in terms of lifetime. So Hubble especially just is just just keeps on trucking, right? It just <laughs> keeps going. And then Kepler as well had that five-year extension just due to the cleverness of, of the engineers at NASA, essentially. So is that possible with James Webb? Or is there a hard stop where it physically cannot last any longer than this? Do we have sort of expectations of lifetime, but then if it exceeds, it might go this long? Yeah, that's uh, another very good question. Um, so the lifetime of Webb is limited by the fuel on board. So uh, Webb's orbit at L2, uh, it's kind of quasi-stable. So we do have to uh, periodically uh, make some adjustments to the orbit to keep it in, you know, to keep it in a stable orbit, basically. Um, and so there's, you know, there, there's a fuel tank, uh, which will be full, but, you know, that's, that's basically kind of what ultimately will limit um, the lifetime. That said, um, in the kind of eng whole engineering of the observatory, the design around, you know, the mass and the fuel availability is always done like really conservatively. So people kind of really, you know, put in lots and lots of different margins. So now that we have all the hardware and everything's together, we do already know that um, we will, the mission will be able to last longer than what was originally planned. So the minimum requirement was actually five years. And so we already know that we will far be able to exceed that just based on the amount of fuel that we will have on board. Um, there are some things we will only know like when Webb is actually in orbit. Um, so there'll still be a lot of things that we can learn along the way um, about how to kind of um, optimize the lifetime. But basically once we run out of fuel, the, the telescope will not be able to keep um, its, its orbit. And we'll all cry that day, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so the reasons are different for all the different missions, but that's for Webb, that's kind of like the situation. What will happen to it when it does run out of fuel? Because it's at L2, which we call the stable point. But as you said, it's sort of circling L2 and we have to make adjustments to keep it there. So if we can't make those adjustments anymore, will it eventually drift out of orbit? Will it eventually spiral into the sun? Like, do we have an idea of what will happen to it? I think it just gradually drifts out of orbit. Yeah, I, I must say I'm not an expert in the kind of spacecraft dynamic side of it. But yeah, I think it will gradually drift out of orbit and we won't be able to kind of point it um, to where it needs to be or perhaps the communications would be affected as well. I imagine it will die a fiery death at some day. But um... <laughs> <laughs> yes. So Webb is often described by people as like a, a successor to Hubble, even though Hubble was, you know, optical plus infrared and this is, is mainly just infrared. Do you think Webb will have that same legacy as, as Hubble has had in terms of, you know, it didn't just have sort of scientific impact, but it had impact on the public too with so many of the images that it that it brought back down. Um, obviously, Webb is imager and spectroscopy, but do you think it will have that same legacy as Hubble? I mean, absolutely, yes. I think... Um, one of the reasons Hubble's impact has been so amazing because it was also like a very, very new that, you know, these images, and it was very strategic when these images were just released publicly. They were on all the front pages. Um, you know, that the amazing data archive that scientists can just keep going back to and reusing the data. And, and I love all the kind of creative creativity that Hubble images have inspired as well with like fashion and jewelry and things like that. So I think, you know, part of Hubble's impact was the newness of it as well. And they've really set the standard. Um, and so I think, you know, people do have high expectations of Webb in that regard, but we will definitely with Webb continue that same kind of, you know, that same approach. Um, so in that sense, uh, Absolutely, you know, absolutely. Um, I think the images are going to be absolutely spectacular. The um, the jump in performance in the infrared compared to anything we've had before is is amazing. Um, and so we're really going to see like resolutions and sensitivities that like we've really never seen before in the infrared. And it's going to, um, in in terms of scientific impact as well. I think you know I'm I'm really excited to see what new questions Webb is going to throw up, uh, you know, which again, with the Hubble Space Telescope, like some of its biggest impacts were things that people really hadn't uh, foreseen at all beforehand. Uh, and I think we can totally expect that with Webb as well, because it's such a new parameter space. And so, you know, in that sense, I, I completely 
think that the uh, it, it is going to have a huge impact. Um, but you know, there'll be some surprises. Like we we probably don't know exactly yet where that impact will be. So I was thinking about how like web has been in the planning stages for so long, right? Like, wasn't it first, like the idea first thought of in the nineties, like way back in sort of 96, 97. So back when it was in the planning stages, did the technology that we needed to do, to actually make James Webb happen, did that exist or did it have to be invented along the way in the sense that we're working with sort of right on the cutting edge kind of technology? Or is this tech that existed back in the late 90s, early 2000s, when it was first in the planning stages that we knew would be possible? Um, I think I think there's a range of answers to that. Um, certainly, you know, I think the scale of web, you know, and how big it is and the number of different subsystems and things that all have to work together, I think is really, uh, you know, very new. Uh, web has a lot of moving parts, literally, you know, because it has to be deployed. And that's really something that no space observatory has had to really do before. So, so there have there are new things that have, have had to be developed along the way. Um, there are certain aspects of the technology as well that um, you know are, are kind of new and really had to be developed for web. Um, I know, for example, the uh, the MIRI instruments that I work on um, is the only part of web that is actually cooled to cryogenic temperatures, so will actually be colder than um, the rest of the observatory. Um, because it is more sensitive to kind of uh, to warm backgrounds, basically. Um, and the cryostat that we use for that, I know there were lots of kind of new aspects of technology uh, to that to get that to work. Um, so there are definitely some aspects of, of technology development that have happened along the way. Um, that said, you know, it's um, to, to launch things into space, we want that to be as little risk as possible. So you have to kind of find this balance between developing new things um to you know to kind of push the envelope but at the same time you also want to be like conservative and make sure that everything has been like really well tested and vetted and verified before you know you commit to putting it in space so there's quite a high bar for new technology to go uh, onto a space mission because we really want to uh, minimize the risk of anything going wrong what are you going to be doing on launch day so um hiding in a I'm, corner yeah, <laughs> So the, the launch day is going to be, you know, incredibly exciting and also very emotional. Uh, there probably will be tears. Um, I hope I will be with members of my team. You know, it's uh, it's going to be like such a big milestone. Um, and and yeah, I really can't wait. It's quite surreal. It's actually quite surreal that launch day is like finally here. It's been a really long road. And um, yeah. And then we have to get to work. That's the thing. The launch is like the start. You know, it's been such a long road, but really it's the start. Uh, and so we're going to have a really busy six months of commissioning. So there's going to be a lot of like round the clock work for all of the different teams and the instruments. Um, so, yeah, it's um, it's going to be really exciting. Yeah. Oh, wish I could be in that room with uh, with you and all the team, though, when, uh, when that happens. Like, <laughs> give me a fly on the wall. <laughs> But yeah, the commission. So we have like a fixed timeline for commissioning, and that starts at like launch minus fifteen minutes. So literally, <laughs> once we're launched, we're like on a schedule of like nice. every, you know, plans by five minutes. Right. The the science instruments don't, you know, that kind of, you know, particularly for for Miri because Miri has to cool down first. Um, so all the other instruments kind of get done before Miri. And then mm -hmm. there's like about three or four weeks at the end where like Miri is just everything is Miri. So we have, we our commissioning is basically like crammed into a really short period. Gosh, I love that they're like 15 minutes after launch. So it's like you watch the launch for like two minutes that disappears, you have a little cry and then the laptop gets cracked. Like, <laughs> hurry on. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So the, the telescopes people, like there's a, there's a whole, you know, so many different teams but like the whole telescopes team and the spacecraft team like they're they're straight to work and they're, yeah. they're what they'll be working like 12 hour shifts 24 hours a day all in the name of science <laughs> yeah 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 is that a web t-shirt that i can see it is it is but it you is can't a... really see it's like Good. one of my team members sure. that's so it. cool oh i love how it's yeah. like fragmenting that's amazing. <laughs> so one of my team members, Nora Lutzkendorf, she's um, she's also on the ESA team. She um, she's an amazing graphic designer, and she she designed this. It's not like official swag or anything, but she no. just had this made. But I think she is actually designing us shirts for commissioning. Um, she should so that we all 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so that's going to be really cool. We were so happy that she's designing them and not some corporate yeah. team yeah. somewhere. Yeah. And hopefully but a yeah, James so... Webb plushie as well. It's a James Webb plushie. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> we should get one hopefully yeah yeah thank you so much to sarah for taking a time out of a very busy day to chat to me for you know the benefit of all of us if you want to hear more from sarah especially as we get closer to the launch and also closer to that first light and first science we're going to do with the james webb space telescope you can follow her over on twitter at, at sarah kendra